everyone. Welcome to our 24th Virtual Research Cafe 10.0. I'm Frank Gomez, Executive Director at STEMnet at the Chancellor's Office. Behind the scenes, we have Monica Alacon, Operations Analyst, STEMnet, and Jesus Perez, our student assistant in undergraduate school at Cal State Long Beach. Much thanks to both of them for working on the logistics and in publicizing today's event. The goal of the CAFE is to help foster research collaborations across the CSU and catalyze submission of joint proposals. The CAFE brings together CSU assistant professors to share their work in a relaxed setting for 10 minutes, reason for why we call it 10.0. We hope you'll find opportunities for collaboration and or learn about a new area that may impact your own program. Feel free to contact any presenter in the chat box when they're not presenting. At the end of all three presentations, we'll come together for a Q&A session. So we and I will be monitoring the chat box to call the questions from the audience. And so let's begin. Once again, we have three great speakers presenting a snapshot of their work. Our first speaker is Dr. Nick Toothman from the Department of Computer and Electrical Engineering at Cal State Bakersfield. Nick, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let me make sure my screen is shared. And you can hear me, right? Okay, good deal. Always worth checking. Uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, so a little bit of background about me. I got my PhD at UC Davis and I studied character animation. So it's computer science, but always had a lot of interest in applying that to artistic expression. Um, but I really like programming with graphics cards and making things run fast. So there's been a lot of overlap between a lot of different disciplines and game studies really kind of orbited this topic no matter where I went. So uh, while I was at Davis, I was a member of the Mod Lab, which was this experimental collaboratory uh, collective between digital humanities, computer science, English, statistics, performance, uh, quite a lot of people involved. And the goal is to foster these research projects that wouldn't normally come together otherwise. So after a bit of planning, we started this project called Play the Knave in 2015. And we pitch it as Shakespeare karaoke, because at its core, that's really what you're doing. Um, we presented a demo to this at the Stratford Shakespeare Festival uh, in the summer festival in Stratford, Ontario, Canada. It was a big deal because it's a very traditional theater, and they are making a stride to embrace new technology and invite new people into their audience. So before you go in for a two and a half hour play, uh, you get to try a two and a half minute scene from the play yourself with up to four people. Uh, we built this using the Unity engine and Microsoft Connect for our motion capture. And uh, a little video of how that looks. Many a nobleman lies stark and stiff under the hooves of vaunting enemies. I prithee, lend me thy sword. So oh, I'll speak over this just a bit. Um, this is a two player scene. We do our best to feed the lines to the players and give them adequate time to perform it. All of the motion capture is coming from this connect. And as you can see, it's very noisy. The data we get uh, often turns into these kind of surprising and amusing glitches. But as it turns out, a lot of audience members really like it um, because it sort of takes some of the pressure off of performing Shakespeare, speaking words you normally wouldn't uh, pronounce or see in everyday life. And it kind of gives you this connection with a bit of distance. Uh, so you're seeing a mirrored version of your own motion uh, in front of you. And because of this structure, it's uh, it's got a few design concerns that we worked around, but ultimately had to make some you know choices on how things would fit. But it was meant to be a collaborative research project between the Mod Lab members intended for collaborative performances between the audience watching the performers and usually laughing or cheering or suggesting the players themselves uh, trying to figure out how much space they can occupy without uh, disrupting each other's movements and disrupting the motion capture. Uh, and this has gone on for quite a bit uh, since 2015. It's been used in classrooms all over the country and in other countries, too. Um, it's been used in art installations and exhibits. It's been used to teach modules on breaking down uh, social 
uh, expectations and it's it's really had a lot of uh, interesting use uh, and with COVID-19, we really had to kind of rethink the whole shared space thing. Um, so in that vein, we started working on a way to create asynchronous play where I might have a four player scene and I perform one role, but I do it by myself. And then we pass it over to someone else who occupies the space on their own. And they act off of a pre-recorded performance of my movement and my voice to sort of layer a scene together uh one person at a time uh and that that closed the gap a little bit it took away some of the magic for one thing because it's more fun with an audience and beyond that we've also been dealing with the fact that the hardware is getting discontinued it's hard to find connects these days uh you can sometimes get them refurbished but they're not making new ones and there hasn't been a good replacement for the device either and it really did a great job for what it was priced at and what it was pitched to do. Um, so the other options out there to replace it just aren't really closing the gap that we saw there. So uh, the project goals that I've been working on are to develop a version of Play the Nave that supports this real-time animation and avatar control as the Kinect does, enable new features that the Kinect couldn't really handle as well, and improve the playback and recording uh, properties of it we also want to preserve the hard work of our content creators, something like 47 people between undergrads, graduates, uh, visiting scholars, all contributed to the 217 scenes we have in our game for Shakespeare performances. And they put a lot of time and work into making those and authoring them and fixing the times. We really want to bring that somewhere new. And we, wherever we bring it, we want it to have a nice, long and happy life on that platform. So that's where we have started looking at virtual reality devices. Our primary target is the MetaQuest 2. There's actually a nice uh, stack of them behind me on this very well uh, made bookshelf. And it's a great device. It's a standalone uh, Android device that does really decent head and hand motion capture, has a built-in microphone for voice capture, and with Unity compatibility, it, it fit the bill pretty well. But we know we don't want to focus on one device in case that also has the same problems. So we're focusing on the OpenXR standard to bring this to a lot of different places all at once. And the experience in the game is quite different between the Kinect and the VR versions. In the Kinect, you have to manage your space constantly. And in VR, the space is whatever you have available. And it's a little more flexible because of that. The Kinect's a uh, classic problem is tracking hand data. It doesn't really know if your hand is facing down or up because the depth data is so limited. It does its best. Uh, with VR, the hand tracking is usually done with controllers and they have a much better idea of where your arm placement is gonna be. You lose lower body tracking with the VR, but it's a decent price to pay. Um, so we've been working on this. I made a very rough demo of this in 2021. And over the last year, uh, Jennifer Quo, my research assistant, and I have been adding features in and testing them over time. We brought this to Meaningful Play in October and won the Best AR VR Experience uh, Award there. So we've made a lot of progress, and it looks something like this now. Zoom ahead. This is a pre-recording. Thou lead me. Speak. I'll go no further. I'm not the best actor, me. as you can hear. I will. My hour is almost come, when I to sulfurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Yes. So uh, the Alas. quality of the motion capture is certainly beyond what we could do with the Connect. The head data is especially nice. The hand movement is pretty good, too. Um, but it's not just about Shakespeare. Uh, that's what we have as our existing data set, so we're certainly going to support it. We allow, and in the old version as well, we allow people to make their own scripts. You can take scenes from a sitcom and collate them with the timings to perform it yourself. You can actually run karaoke with music if you want to. Uh, the applications for this kind of performance environment are really meant to you know, open up more opportunities. If you need to rehearse a scene or practice memorization of lines, it's great for that kind of thing. 
If you want to practice uh, learning another language, you can have cues and get interactions with a, a pre-recorded kind of safe to make mistakes environment as you're learning. And it's a really nice platform for low budget motion capture. So where I'm looking for collaboration here are people that are interested in asynchronous interactions. Think of the flexibility of email, but with more presence in terms of your movement and your voice and having a spatial shared experience with other people, even if it's not live. Uh, for people looking at virtual or virtual seminars, performance and movement studies, it's a really great tool. Uh, I've had some experience designing and executing experiments, experiments entirely in VR, great for data capture and reproducibility. And uh, anyone looking at social presence as well has a really nice platform to look at here. If you have the ideas on how you might want to use this, love to hear them too. And if you have a device, I'm looking for people to help test the multiplayer as it comes live. So that's what I have for you. Thank you so much for your time. And I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Nick. I see lots of opportunities here, and I definitely will be speaking to you, um, you know, given, you know, my own participation in an HSI STEM grant, which is focused in uh, VR, uh, AR, MR, XR. So, you know, let's chat after, but certainly I'm sure we'll have some questions going forward. All of in, the uh, R's. We can't decide. What to yeah, call. yeah, in the Q&A. Sure. So our next speaker is uh, Archana Anand from SF State and from the Department of Biology. Floor is yours. Thank you, Frank. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Before I begin, I'd like to thank STEMnet for inviting me to participate. I'm very grateful for the audience for your time. I'd also like to acknowledge all my collaborators, mentors, and funding sources. None of this work would be possible without them. Today, I'd like, you take to, I'd like to take you through my journey from engineer to biologist as I looked at nutrient impacts in a very polluted marine environment, how I got sucked into wastewater-based epidemiology, and I'd like to share my vision for what I'd like to accomplish in my lab at SF State to explore synergies with some of you or many of you. In 2007, I graduated uh, with a degree in engineering from Singapore, but I took on some jobs and I wasn't particularly satisfied intellectually. This was also when I traveled extensively and I met my fiance then and my husband now, um, and we decided to move to Hong Kong. This was where I took up a master's in environmental science and I met my PhD advisor. He's the one on the floor in this picture. Um, Dr. David Baker is a marine biologist, and when I approached him and said, I want to do a project in environmental science, he said, I'm a biologist, you're an engineer, so let's find middle ground in chemistry. And so it began. But before I give you an overview of what I did, I just wanted to give you a context. Now, just 10 rivers carry over 90% of all the marine litter into the global oceans. Eight of these rivers are in Asia. We're all talking about plastics. We've banned the use of straws. This is great, but what about sewage? Do you know where your sewage goes? Over 90% of all the world's wastewater is untreated. Now, wastewater carries nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, which when in excess can exacerbate the way some microorganisms grow over others. They respire rapidly and deplete oxygen concentrations in the ocean, resulting in hypoxic areas or dead zones. This is not new to Hong Kong, which has a population density of over 7,000 people per square kilometer of land. Think about this in contrast with say Iceland, which has a population density of three people per square kilometer of land. Um, but Hong Kong is unique because it still is rich in marine life. It has many more corals than you can find, hard corals than you can find in the Caribbean. 
So I began the glamorous task of looking at wastewater all over Hong Kong. But the reason to do this was that the government of Hong Kong was tracking all pollutants and nutrients. They were upgrading wastewater treatment facilities, but we did not know what what where the pollution was coming from, the sources. And we had no idea how it was affecting life. So this was where I came in because I brought in some quantitative skills and I was entering the field from a chemistry standpoint. And I decided to not just rely on nutrient chemistry, but I also decided to use a new toolkit, which included stable isotope analysis. Now, concentration can only tell you how much of something is present. It cannot tell you where it's coming from. Stable isotopes can only tell you where something is coming from, and they cannot tell you how much of something is present. So I decided to use both these tools together. And what I found was that Hong Kong's seawater, the delta 15N value, stable isotope of nitrogen, closely resembled that of treated sewage. Now, this was very interesting, but and it did result in several other studies. But I'd like to now make a segue and share what that means for us here at SF State and within the CSUs. I have an interest in setting up an EAIRMS core facility for the CSUs to use that for both teaching as well as research. And if this is something that you would be potentially interested in exploring, or if you already have significant experience in, do get in touch with me and I'd love to talk to you more about that. Now, coming back to science, this was also when I had my first baby. This is Advik, he's six years old. Um, and I had now kind of uh, earned my right of passage to look at marine life, or so I thought. But then, so I wanted to look at what lived in the environment, but I needed a skill, and it was scuba diving. Um, so that I spent a considerable amount of time, which was also some of the best months uh, of my life, learning how to scuba dive in a very, very um, challenging environment to dive in. Um, and subsequently after that, I began to use some standardized sampling methodologies, one of which is what you see here, it's called the Ocean ARMS. ARMS stands for Autonomous Reef Monitoring Structures. Essentially, they are mini ocean hotels. And what they do is we deploy them by scuba on the seafloor for one to two years, after which we collect and look at everything that has colonized the plates using uh, photography as well as their DNA signatures. And the idea was to look at things that are unknown, unnamed, or invisible to the naked eye, which is what occupies about 60 to 70% of life in the ocean even today. And we were surprised to see, all you need to focus on is the big teal line that you see here. We were surprised to see the richness in the taxa we found when we compared them to other relatively pristine sites around the world. And this is exactly what I'm hoping to do here in San Francisco Bay as well. Um, I didn't think this could have happened because Hong Kong is already very eutrophic and polluted, but San Francisco Bay is apparently the most invaded bay in the world. So if I had to choose a place to land, this it couldn't have been more perfect than what just happened. Um, but I'd like to just highlight that this project also provided plenty of scope for community engagement. Um, we had we worked with school students, um, middle school, high school, as well as university students. And what they did was they helped in processing the different arm plates. Um, and this is what a plate looks like. They're very beautiful. We would help them identify the different taxa. And they would also find sort and cause sort to different organisms. So it was part of their curriculum as well. And it was a very interesting exercise. Um, we also had a lot of non-native speakers walk in and um, non-native English speakers walk in and talk to us about what we were finding. So it was a very um, a good piece of community engagement that that's why I wanted to highlight that. Um, moving on here at SF State, I would also like to, and of course, um, look for synergies with others um, in, within the CSUs to look at different nutrient impacts from the source to the sink. Um, what you see here is the Oceanside Treatment Facility, and I've been working with them 
they have given me permission to get some samples. Um, and I ideally would like to identify discharge outfalls and then along a transect, look at microbial biodiversity and the health of the ecosystem. So that is what you see here in this video. What I'm doing is deploying tea bags. This is with me and my dive buddy, Tehun, on the right. We are burying tea bags in the seafloor to look at the rate of decomposition, as well as we want to quantify how much carbon can be stored or sequestered in that site. And the tea leaves essentially serve as a perfect mechanism because they are essentially representing organic matter that we want to quantify um, the decomposition. And another thing that I worked on was using this simple assay called a squid pop. What it refers to is you see a dried piece of squid that is attached to a metal rod and serves as bait for fish. And the extent to which the fish consume the bait serves as the is directly correlated with the intensity of predation in that site. So these are very simple tools that were cheap. Uh, students could use them uh, and we could quantify important measures within an ecosystem. And this is also something that I'm hoping to bring here um, and work out of EOS, which is uh, the Estuarine and Ocean Science Center also at SF State. Um, I'm hoping to work there to engage students and characterize something similar there. Now, this was also when I had my second baby. This is Adit. He is a pandemic baby, which, which is why he has a onesie that says my parents did not practice social distancing. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about was wastewater-based epidemiology. I'm not sure if any of you recognize who this is. This is Jon Snow, not from the Game of Thrones. He is um, an English physician, and he was the one who actually helped trace how cholera was transmitted in London in the 1800s. And that made a perfect segue to what we used it for extensively during the pandemic. Um, this was in 2020 all the way to 2022 during my postdocs at uh, Stanford and at Columbia, where I was engaged um, with yes, looking at SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 in wastewater, not just in campuses, but also in the wastewater treatment plant itself. And that's what you see here in terms of the installation of the water sampler. And we looked at some mutations and associated that with infectivity and transmissibility. Um, so to that end here at SF State, I have been working with the facilities team. I have pictures here. We've been popping open several manholes to look at optimal sites to set up a campus wastewater surveillance effort. And I'm hoping to make connections with some of you here as well, if you're interested in doing something similar in other CSUs. Um, I have a little dog now. And with that, I would like to end uh, my seminar. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if there are other things that you'd like to talk about. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Very, very, very interesting uh, that you do work uh, in this area. Very interdisciplinary. Very, very intriguing. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Our next speaker is uh, Taylor Thane from just around the corner from me here, actually about 20 miles away, Cal Poly Pomona from the Department of Chemistry, Taylor. Let me unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction um, uh, and inviting me to speak today. Um, so my name is Taylor Thane and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the work I am interested in carrying out here at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, so just a bit about my background. I am coming to Cal Poly Pomona from the University of California, Irvine, where I um, studied developing new chemical reactions in graduate school. Um, I joined uh, CPP in the fall, um, so I am very new in my career here, um, but I'm interested in continuing developing these new chemical transformations. Um, and just some hobbies, I enjoy baking, outdoors, and I love bulldogs. <laughs> All right, so why am I interested in developing new reactions? So we can compare our chemical knowledge and the reactions we use to synthesize molecules to a toolbox and you know, all of the engineering knowledge that goes into building a molecule. And so here we can see you know, these complex molecules, we need all of these different tools to build, sorry, these complex buildings. 
Um, and so I'm interested in developing new reactions that we can add to our toolbox as synthetic chemists to build complex and biologically relevant molecules. And so my specific goal here is to develop new reactions that utilize sustainable first row transition metal catalysis to take simple molecules and convert them into much larger, more complex looking structures. So transition metal catalysis has made a really big impact in the field of organic chemistry, um, especially as you know we need to synthesize these complex drugs um, and other you know related molecules like pesticides. How do we do that efficiently? So cross coupling reactions specifically. Um, were developed and have been a really great way to efficiently access challenging bonds. Um, and they allow us to construct these larger and more complex molecules by allowing us to quickly form carbon-carbon bonds. Carbon-carbon bonds make up the backbone of all of our molecules, right? And so the ability to easily access and make these carbon-carbon bonds in one step is super important. And so this work um, and the importance of this work is evident by the 2010 Nobel Prize that went to Richard Heck, Aichi Nagishi, and Akira Suzuki for their work developing cross-coupling reactions. And so in a cross-coupling reaction, we can imagine taking two fragments of a molecule or different molecules. Um, imagine the blue dot being one fragment, our green square being the other fragment, and in the pr presence of our transition metal catalyst, we can quickly and efficiently stitch those two fragments together, forming a new carbon-carbon bond and making our more complex structure. And so cross-coupling reactions uh, have been used to synthesize a variety of different pharmaceutical or pharmaceutically relevant molecules, three of which I have shown below. We have Lasartan, lapatinib, and ruxolitinib. Um, all of these molecules have bonds highlighted in yellow, and these bonds were the bonds that were formed by cross-coupling reactions. And so here we can see that these are larger, more complex molecules, and we can imagine cutting this molecule in half. And so those would come from the two halves of the molecule being stitched together. So in the pharmaceutical industry, medicinal chemists or med chemists, they, their goal is to take different reactions to synthesize molecules and test them for biological activity to see if they will be you know, useful compounds or drug candidates. And so what this graph shows is a variety of reactions, I think there's about 15 here, that are used frequently in medicinal chemistry to synthesize these molecules. Um, and it's comparing molecules um, from 2015-ish to the 1980s. And so we can see here that um, the suzuki miara coupling, Sonagashira coupling, and this Buckwald-Hartwig coupling, um, while these reactions were not widely used in the 1980s because they weren't very well known, now are um, in this top set of reactions that are used um, for synthesizing more complex molecules in medchem and pharma. And so I'm interested in developing nickel catalysis. Palladium catalysis and palladium metal um, has been really well known and is really well understood for these cross-coupling reactions. And so here you can see I'm comparing nickel to a screwdriver, palladium to a hammer, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but I'm more interested in developing nickel catalysis for a variety of reasons. The most apparent reason would be that nickel is more abundant than palladium. Uh, palladium, sorry, nickel, because it's more abundant is less expensive, of course, um, but also it has a smaller carbon footprint associated with the mining of the metal. So using metals like nickel, copper, and iron are becoming increasingly important. Nickel in particular though, when compared to palladium, has a broader range of reactivity, which means nickel can do more reactions in more different ways than say palladium traditionally can. And so what that allows us to do now is that allows us to gauge, engage bonds like carbon oxygen bonds and carbon nitrogen bonds 
that metals like palladium that are traditionally used have a challenging or harder time engaging or reacting with. And so here I kind of come back to this analogy where, you know, our metal catalysts are our tools that we want to develop for these reactions. Um, but we really want to understand how these reactions work. So we really understand the mechanisms um, behind how palladium catalyzed reactions occur. And so here I'm comparing it to a hammer where with a hammer, we're just using force to get that piece or that nail into a piece of wood where nickel, the reactivity is a bit more complicated and it's less well understood. Um, and so I compare this to a screwdriver where the mechanism of action for screwing a screw into a piece of wood is a little bit more complicated than say a hammer. And so we need to do experiments to better understand how nickel catalysis works so that we can more efficiently develop new um, and more innovative reactions. And so this is one potential area where, um, you know, I can work with collaborators that do computational calculations to help study the transition states and the mechanisms behind how nickel catalysis works. So with that, I'm going to change gears a little bit. So I've talked about, you know, I wanna develop new reactions using nickel catalysis, um, but I'm specifically interested in applying nickel catalysis to oxetanes and using oxetanes as coupling partners. So I have, um, you know, a picture of an oxetane, just a very simple oxetane up here. Oxetanes are four-membered rings that contain an oxygen atom. And because they're small four-membered rings, there's a lot of strain associated with them. And so these oxetanes wanna undergo ring opening reactions which makes them reactive intermediates and potentially interesting coupling partners for nickel catalyzed reaction development. But oxetanes are actually also found in a variety of different medicinal agents and pharmaceutically relevant compounds. Uh, here we can see this very simple, yet still um, highly substituted uh, oxetane, oxetin. Um, and then we have lan raplanib and oxytinosin A, which again, we have a more simple monosubstituted oxetane. And then here we have a more complex looking oxetane structure here. So while these are interesting intermediates, they also have interesting biological activity associated with them. And so we can kind of synthesize these via a variety of mechanisms, but for a simple molecule that we're trying to access in the middle, if we think back to what we can make them from, um, in these structures here, these actually are more complicated looking than in the center. Um, but paterno buki developed a reaction where we can just stitch these two double bonds together, forming a bond between these carbon atoms and this carbon oxygen atom. Now this reaction is really cool and was developed in the 1950s because it stitches these two um, double bonds together to make this highly substituted oxetane but it does this in one step using sunlight. And so this reaction really kind of inspires me to develop new transformations that utilize oxetanes as intermediates because oxetanes are made from simple and widely available starting materials and they rapidly install molecular complexity. Unfortunately, there are some safety concerns associated with working with these reactions that utilize UV light on scale. Um, so there's also room for development in developing new reactions that target these oxetanes as well. So my goal is to develop new nickel catalyzed cross coupling reactions that essentially convert simple starting materials into more complex molecules. Um, I've really focused on talking about the oxetanes as um, intermediates that I'm looking forward to using in these new nickel catalyzed cross coupling reactions. Um, and again, I'd like to study these mechanisms of how these reactions work as we develop them in more detail. Um, and so there is a variety of potential for collaboration on this work. Um, you know, as we access new biologic or potentially biologically active oxetane scaffolds, we will need someone to test um, the potency of these molecules. And we will also need to perform or have someone um, that understands and is an expert in DFT calculations or other computational calculations to investigate these mechanisms. 
Um, and if you need someone to synthesize a molecule, I can do that. <laughs> uh, so with that, I'd be happy to you know, answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Taylor. Uh, I never saw uh, nickel and palladium uh, have the comparison to a screwdriver and hammer, but it's a first for everything. So uh, I'd like to open it up now to our audience. If they have any questions, you can just uh, speak up. We're small enough. You can ask uh, anything to our, uh, our speakers, uh, as well as speakers can also engage with other speakers too. So we'll open it up and you can either raise your hand or just show your face or however you want to do it. So the floor is everyone's now. Yes, Khalil. Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for hosting this. This is a great network uh, to be connected uh, with other CSU in, 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 in Southern California here. And uh, uh, we are all open to collaboration. And I will have my faculty members also reach out to some of those speakers of research interest. I was wondering if anybody here or from the speakers have a grant that is currently funded by NSF or other funding agencies? Not yet? Okay. Uh, reach out to me or to Frank and we can collaborate. We do have a great resources with NSF as well as the NSF uh, Engineering Directorate. Uh, if it's close enough to biotechnology, bioinformatics, bioengineering, all these fields are very much related to um, what we have at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at CSUSB. Um, so reach out to me if you wish, um, reach out to my faculty as well. Uh, I do have a few of them who are uh, engaged with uh, hospitals in LA, as well as with uh, 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 Cal State Los Angeles and other uh, also institutions. I did work uh, actually with uh, uh, Cal Poly Pomona a few years ago. Uh, and uh, um, truly, thank you so much for reaching out. But anytime, hey, drop me an email and we'll see how we can uh, work things out. Of course, uh, Frank has been uh, a great in facilitating this uh, connection. Yeah, and I hope more faculty members also will join next time we'll meet uh, at this cafe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kalila. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did have a question for Dr. Anand. Um, when you do dives for your work, uh, you, you said you learned how to scuba. Are you are you able to kind of do everything you need down to like the 60 foot depth for like open water certification or have you had to do any specialty training or my like, scuba is highly specialized but i guess there's like you know the 100 feet depth and you know night diving and things like that um have you been uh developing more in that area uh thank you for asking that question i really enjoyed your talk by the way <laughs> um I was, yes, I had to do um, open water, advanced open water rescue and scientific diving. Um, That's really cool. And I had to do all those certifications to make sure that I could, they, I could do the work that I had to do. But I mm. did not, uh, the work that I'm doing is not uh, very deep. So most mm. of it is within 10 meters. Okay. In fact, in Hong Kong, it's actually even shallow, five to eight feet but the visibility is really bad. So it's, yeah. you would hardly be able to see your hand. Um, and, you know, we would have to do work with a hammer and a chisel or something um, and right. get scraps of coral that we could use as samples. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the shallow dives are nice because you can stay down for longer and you don't have as much normalizing to, to go back up. So that's nice. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Um, 
Yeah, I saw, I like the little, what did you call them? Little hotels or something underneath? Oh, yeah, mini ocean hotels. <laughs> yeah, that was very, very interesting. Uh, you know, Nick, we can chat a little bit after, but you're, um, where, yeah, you know, VR, mm -hmm. You know, we, I know the people we work with, I work with, you know, use Oculus Rift sure. as, you know, their, their source of, of VR equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so where do you think, and I know what your sphere is right now, because you gave some really nice you know, little movies there. Where do you think, and I'm always interested in the research questions. Yeah. What is it that you're trying, you know, people are not going to give you money because, you know, the technology looks really neat. Right, and this right. goes with anybody, but mm -hmm. what are you trying to solve? What might you, what might, what areas do you think are, are, uh, have yet to be touched by VR mm -hmm. that you think what you're doing might fit into them? Yeah. So with the connect version of our work, it was developed with the intent of using it in, in classroom environments. And we are actually, drafting a grant proposal it's the draft of the draft you know it's not really formed yet but one thing we were looking at with uh, the use of vr for you know performance studies is the ability to kind of mix and match and remix uh the experiences people have so uh there's scenes in a fellow where if you want students to uh, gain a first impression, maybe you don't tell or show who's playing who. And with software like this, you can kind of hold back some of the information about the uh, characters in a scene uh, so that people make their own impressions based off of the text of the performance. And then you can sort of mix and match it even further. All that stuff we have right now, it's just the robot. Um, the Connect version has a whole bunch of costumes and avatars to choose from, and it's a slow process bringing those over. But one idea we were thinking of was using that to study the interactions between it's a husband and a wife in a scene. You don't know who is who um, because they're both generic avatars. So you gain all of your context from the text that they're performing. And the interpretations can vary quite a lot depending on if people think the scene is amusing or if it's dealing with domestic abuse. It's, it can have a lot of range in that one little spot. So we were looking at ways to sort of uh, introduce the themes of material without giving it all away at, at once and letting students kind of explore what that means to them uh, to sort of meet them where they come from. Uh, so in a classroom environment, having something like that's kind of nice to do. Um, your performance is kind of masked in VR by the virtue of your embodying an avatar. So you don't look like you normally would. And depending on how much of that you give information wise, you can, you know, have a lot of experimentation. What you can do with the data capture is have a bunch of these performances uh, from different amateurs, professionals. And then you can even remix those performances so that two people that never performed it together are now composited into a scene. And you can use that to uh, present material to others and use as a, um, as a corpus in order to figure out, are people catching clues just from context? Does the performance make that much of a difference? Um, the English professor side of the projects know a little bit more about this than I do, but in terms of doing the data capture and uh, preparing material for, you know, survey study, that's that's kind of where my my expertise comes into there. So really being able to sort of uh, turn a performance into components and then have a little more control out however they fit back together is something that. VR can really help with compared to what we could do with the Connect. It's it's a very nice gap to clear. So that's one idea we're hoping to play with more in the future. 
Hi, Nick. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, sure. Have you considered applying VR to maybe other themes, such as maybe in the marine life, um, in a classroom or in, on marine ecology, or maybe if we're looking at pathogens, uh, to have students engage with different pathogens um, of different sizes in a lab um, or something like that? <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. There's. I'm going to need to find this project name again, but uh, when I was working at Oculus for a while as an intern, there was someone there who was working on a marine life VR experience. Um, so for his job, he got to do all sorts of diving and traveling and underwater camera capture and, you know, the dream job for him. It was pretty amazing to see what he would come back uh, week to week with. And it's it's really nice for that immersive experience and could even be useful getting people acquainted with the idea of being underwater, especially if they're worried about things like claustrophobia or, you know, getting the appeal of it before having to do all the safety training, you know, sort of bring the carrot out before uh, the stick when it comes to safety. But yeah, it's the, the opportunities for that kind of stuff. There's a lot you can do in a safe and kind of controlled environment. And VR has been one of the most immersive ways to offer that so but yeah there's i'll have to find a few links and i can send them to you when i when i get this all together because there's a few projects that have looked at this kind of thing and when you have the budget for it some of the stuff is really amazing and uh dr thane i think i've also seen projects that utilize uh molecular structure studies in virtual reality too kind of in the same way that like protein folding is such a complicated 3D problem that having a desktop 2D view of it, it, it's hard to really appreciate just how difficult that is to solve. So the gamification of like protein folding, making a difficult problem into something that gamers want to figure out has done a lot for uh, you know biology. And I think in the chemistry world, there could be some really neat ways to use that as well. Um, it's actually I don't know really if you a good Go idea ahead. because I've been I've been trying on figuring out trying to figure out a way to like we have uh, multimedia like creators um, mm -hmm. and I'm like I wonder if there's a way we could like teach students how to do some very basic concepts in chemistry that are very hard to grasp like the movement of electrons is something mm -hmm. that we try to teach students but it's like so I don't want to say like hand wavy but we teach it in a way where they think about it backwards and not forwards. <laughs> right. This seems like an interesting, you know, way to possibly maybe get them to interact in a more friendly way with that yeah. kind of content. So I'm going to put something, this is just FYI. I only recently, some of you may have heard of this, the Heilemeyer Catechism. Pretty much it's somebody from DARPA who years ago, <laughs> who's no longer with us. Um, we don't always need to find a way to, you know, to cut bread you know, what are the problems we're trying to solve if we're trying to find a new way to cut bread? So kind of the same thing holds true here. You know, we have this technology, which I'm not saying it isn't new anymore, but, you know, VR, call it whatever you want, XR, MR, AR, what have you. But what is it that, how is it going to improve in terms of what we already do? And let's just look at learning, for example, okay? Since we're the CSU, doesn't mean, you know, we're we're not interested in the technical side of things. Um, so this HSI, uh, NSF HSI STEM grant I'm on is, um, it has to do with, with VR. Um, and it's really in teaching the faculty to utilize it from three different campuses, uh, San Jose, Sonoma State, and Fresno State, as well as Fresno City College. And it's for faculty that have some knowledge of VR and some, some technical skills. But it's, uh, and they're a mishmash of faculty from different disciplines. And so 
it's kind of like all of you where you do have somebody who has a, a lot more background expertise in VR and those who are interested in the technology and just are trying to find how it fits into their discipline. So there's the, there's the technical side of the equation here and the ramp up in if one wants to create modules or whatever you want to call it for your disciplines. And then there's the content part in your disciplines. And then there's also, you know, what is the educational foundations you want to do this work on? Okay. You just don't want to do it because it's fun, but you want to do it because what is the motivation for NSF, for example, to fund you? You know, you have to look at it from the optics. So I always kind of, you know, tell faculty if, you know, they may have some neat, really neat idea, but it's not a good idea if nobody wants to give you money to do it. Okay. But it might be a good idea. So I think the same thing holds here true. You know, what is already out there? May it be in terms of the chemistry side of things? You're looking at kinetics, you know, in you know, I'm an analytical chemist by training, but we used to do a lot of receptor ligand binding types of stuff. Okay. So you look at, you know, how things bind, things like what have you. And then, then biology, you know, there's certainly a lot of opportunities there in terms of may it be in, you know, in the sea, may it be in terms of antibiotics or whatever you want to do it on, okay? But what is it that you're trying to teach? Are you looking at how to teach? And what are the outcomes you want to achieve from the students in terms of them staying interested in, chem, in, in STEM, you know, it's an identity, you know, sense of belonging. Um, so I'm kind of looking at it from, from that perspective that, look, we have this neat toy, need for better words, you know, let's just call it VR, but how might you want to apply it? Because I think there's a lot of opportunities in it. You just have to find ways to craft this new technology and you know, there's people that do have the expertise in the technology, and then there are those who have the expertise in the content part of it. And then you have those people in education that a lot of us here don't have that expertise in, in terms of the educational foundations on how students learn, why they learn, how better they can learn, and the teaching aspects of it too. So I always want people to kind of look at it from that perspective as, you know, where, where do you wanna go? Where do you see this? If you do look at this VR, and I'm just looking at it here because it's a small group of us right now, um, because this is how we got our, our rapid grant funded and the HSI STEM grant funded and, and other things funded by bringing faculty together that are in different disciplines, but we're all, they're all faculty and they're trying to use a technology, okay, and some sort of you know, augmented technology in their courses and yes, it will have spillover in terms of their research too. I mean, that's if, if they want that. So I kind of throw that out, maybe too long of a commentary from me, but just to give you some perspective and if you have any comments. So it's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. It's nice to have something to help focus uh, the intent and when you do get lost in the excitement and the details, which has happened to me with this a lot. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is really useful too. Uh, thank you for making this connection, uh, Frank. And I think it's just sometimes you, you you have it staring at you, but then you you know you need someone to kind of like say these things and then it puts things together. I also think there's a really good pull for using technology in any proposal, especially, I mean, in, in the ocean itself, even if there's like a microbiology component to it, if there's technology that is integrated with that, um, it's a big sell as well. So even personally for me, like I would really be excited to, you know, connect with you, um, Nick, after this call to see if, you know, there's something that could be done perhaps uh, sooner rather than later, or even as a, you know, long-term vision to see how there could be small components that could be integrated into like mesocosm experiments or something that I'm, I, you know, will be a potential avenue for student projects. Um, yeah. So with that being said, I know we're a small group right now. It's been great for everyone to participate today. Really very interesting talks. I really enjoyed the videos. We don't see that often and really from everybody in our virtual cafes and the fact that, you know, everybody had some, uh, had aspects of that, you know, nice pictures, what have you, it really 
adds to it because you know we're very we're visual people okay and it's one thing to just have text when you're giving a talk you know, we don't want to we don't want to do that we actually like to see some movement and even the sound in the background so you know it was just a slice of your work i really appreciate that and uh you know if there's any opportunities for collaboration going forward you know by all means you can always you know reach out to to me uh, because we have connectors all across the CSU system. We've probably been on about 40 proposals over the past three years, and about half of them have been funded. NSF, Department of Education, Department of Defense, California Learning Lab, and we also have industry money too. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in pursuing anything like that, by all means, you know, reach out to me, okay? So with that being said, enjoy your weekend. And we uh, hope, hope to hear from you, okay? Take care, everyone.